Welcome back. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this session about Herland. I'm Niels van Maanen. I'm the training coordinator for Herland, and I will be hosting uh, this session. Herland looks at landscapes as heritage, as significant cultural values. And deciding to preserve or to transform these landscapes is to, to decide to transform uh, or to maintain these cultural values. Think of old harbors, a slaughterhouse, or a gas factory that lose their original function. The people who used to work there, their children, their grandchildren, often they, they still live nearby, they value this landscape. But so do new businesses artists and creative industry excited by these extraordinary landscapes. So do new residents looking for leisure or shopping possibilities. And so do international visitors hoping to experience an authentic local site, but with the comforts of modern tourism. All these different groups value this landscape, but for different reasons and decisions about how to preserve or transform the landscape also affects how attractive or useful these landscapes are to these different people. And the same goes for forests, farmlands, coastlines, and even high-rise residential estates. Different groups value these landscapes. And these landscapes are subject to pressures for change. Climate change, migration, economic cycles, digital innovation. And therefore, these landscapes become the object of planning processes. This interaction between landscapes as cultural values and various societal demands and stakeholders in the context of planning processes is at the heart of Herland. Like Terra Nova, Harriland is a Marie Curie training and research network with 15 PhDs and their supervisors who work in academia, in industry and in government. This session will highlight what Harriland aims to bring in terms of new knowledge and innovative practice in the planning of future landscapes. First, the project leader, Gertjan Burgers, and one of the early stage researchers, Anna Tonk, will tell us more about the vision and the general setup of Herland. Next, we will zoom in on one societal challenge, climate change, and we will discuss what happens when green energy sources, wind turbines, solar panels, are planned in historic landscapes. How do stakeholders deal with the possibilities but also with the tensions that arise. And finally, we look at global networks as a result of digital social media and the increasing connectedness of people across national and continental boundaries. How do these networks impact how landscapes are valued and managed? I now pass the floor to Gertjan Burgers, the project leader of Herriland. He's a professor in heritage studies at the Faculty of Humanities at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Gertjan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Niels, for introducing me, for introducing the Ireland project, and uh, let me continue on this. It is really my pleasure to present the Ireland project, and not only maybe my pleasure, but also a kind of a task, a responsibility to do so, uh, to disseminate the work that we do. Why? because we have a vision, we have an idea about how to develop future landscape, how to create future landscape. That is what I would like to talk about. That is what we, what we would like to talk about today. And I will kick off together with Anna Tonk. First of all, let me show you my PowerPoint. And I will go to this slide. What is Harland? Harland is, like Terra Nova, a training and research network financed by the Marie Curie scheme 
the European Marie Curie scheme, which is on cultural heritage and the planning of European landscape. We've got about 25 public and private partners. It, I mean, uh, it increases. And um, it is coordinated by six universities, which we see here, uh, the University of Amsterdam, Bezalel Academy of Fine Arts in Jerusalem, University of Gothenburg, Roma Tre University, TU Delft, and Newcastle University. So this is the starting point. So I told you about the vision. We've got a mission as well. What is our mission? That is this, actually, to train a new generation to approach heritage as a key resource to create sustainable and inclusive landscapes. Now, what do I mean with this? It means that we do not focus only, for instance, on such traditional iconic landscapes, iconic heritage sites like this one. I don't have to mention to tell you what this is, actually. This is one of these traditional iconic landscapes that are cherished not only by Italian society, by, but by world society, it's, one, it's, it's among uh, the, uh, the UNESCO World Heritage List. We don't focus only on such iconic sites. Rather, we focus instead on all that has potential heritage value in the future. That changes the picture, of course. Uh, and we think that is the entire living environment, as a matter of fact. Um, well, here are just some of the images. Uh, it includes rural and marginal landscapes, industrial and urban landscapes, energy landscapes, which are often seen in contrast, of course, with traditional historic landscapes, and, and of course, also the iconic heritage landscapes. It is society that decides, in the end, what the heritage landscapes of the future look like. What we wish to do with Harryland is to train people to recognize this and to use this to create a sustainable, uh, inclusive and also democratic future. Well now, at the heart of the project, here they are, the 15 PhDs, uh, the 15 PhD students uh, across Europe. We see them here together with the, the senior researchers, their teachers. And uh, together, they are to disseminate the Harland approach. Now, again, what is that heritage, a uh, Harland approach? Here again, uh, the main characteristic of the Harland approach is that we do not isolate heritage as a mere relique of the past to protect against external uh, outside interventions. On the contrary, as a matter of fact, rather our training and research is aimed at planning, as Niels already pointed out, at planning future heritage landscapes in relation to such interventions, to such outside interventions, in relation to some of the most pressing societal challenges of today. And here we see them. Shifting demography, demographies, for instance, multiculturalism related to it, changing environments, evident in this, uh, this this uh, symposium on changing on future landscapes, digital transformations and also democratization. So these are the major societal challenges that we wish to relate to the heritage discussion. Another characteristic of Harryland is that we recognize that um, all too often academic research remains academic and rather theoretical. Yes, we cherish theory, which is important. Critical theory, without it, it is, um, um, which it, it's, it's not useless, but uh, in our case, it is a loss. However, um, characteristic of our project is also to bring theory into practice, and we do so in various ways. Uh, through internships, for instance, internships with our associate partners, business, uh, government, for instance, uh, but also through living labs, so-called living labs. Each um, PhD has its or uh, has her or his uh, living lab in which um, 
questionnaires are being sent out, interviews are being done, all kinds of anthropological research is being done, uh, analysis are being done. So that is bringing theory in practice. And we actually have two of these living labs functioning to bring everything, everybody together. And that is, of course, a great learning school, bringing everybody together with all uh, the various disciplines working on specific assignments. Here, for instance, Rome will be one of our living labs for next year, where we will uh, work on the Ostiense area, which uh, has quite some, uh, some abandoned industry, like here, and this, which you see in this picture. The assignment is to really develop this area. And uh, we are going to bring forward, to come up with policy documents to present them to the municipality uh, how to redevelop this area. So that is a fantastic challenge, of course. And another major characteristic of Harryland is its international or even its transnational character. As a matter of fact, you can safely say transnational as a matter of fact. Um, we have people from all over the globe, but also mixed, very strongly mixed, and um, that goes for teachers as well as, as students, as PhD students. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the Harland approach has global appeal. And it is uh, enhanced even by UNESCO and also by the EU. Now, I think we have managed to bring together within Harryland the best of all these worlds, UNESCO, EU, and, and also from national and even regional context. Uh, in our work, indeed, uh, in that work, we have brought them all together. And um, not only students, not only PhD students and teachers, but also stakeholders um, from the world of government, stakeholders from the world of business, a very wide diversity. The key of all this is, of course, that they come from different fields, different sectors in society, different disciplines within academics. In our project, indeed, archaeologists and historians work together with economists, for instance, with spatial planners, with architects and also social scientists. And that brings me, in the end of my talk, to this picture here, this diagram, which shows in a nutshell, let me explain it to you, in a nutshell, what Harland is about. Below, we start below with the activities, what we put into the project. That is research, training, and valorization. And all of these are focused around the four major societal challenges that you see depicted here. That is democratization. Uh, the climate change, the energy transition, shifting demograph demographies, and again, multiculturalism and migration are part of that challenge. And digital transformation, those are the major challenges that we work on. Then uh, we go to the top. Uh, what would we like to be the outcome of the project? What would be uh, our impact? That is, first of all, a new generation of professionals academics, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, etc. but a new generation that uh, we train indeed with the Harland approach. A scientific publications, it's evident almost. Training programs, maybe less evident, uh, training programs uh, on the postdoctoral scale, but also on the say, graduate scale, actually. And uh, I think this is very important, of course, training education, is the future. Then, of course, also decision support tools and policy recommendations. So this is the impact that we wish to achieve. We do so, going to the left, by uh, engaging a whole series of partners. As I told you already, uh, these are the categories, the main categories, universities, SMEs, uh, governments, various levels, and, and NGOs. And, and going to the right, involved are a whole series of disciplines, and these are just, uh, well, the major ones. Archaeology, data science, geography, heritage studies, history, planning and design, and urbanism. And I realize now that architecture is still missing for the architects amongst us. So this is indeed what Harland stands for. 
And this is what maybe we are going to uh, explain even further in the next talks. And actually, I would like to present, is it my task to present Anna Tonk? I do think so. Yes, uh, Anna, uh, Anna Tonk is one of the PhD researchers that we are proud of in uh, working in the context in, of Harryland. She is based at Newcastle and her research topic is on post-industrial landscapes. She will give a more detailed introduction in her own speech. I would like to pass the floor to Anna. I'm Anna Tonk and I am part of Project Harryland and I am here to tell you about my experience so far as a PhD student at Newcastle University. I now live in Newcastle but before that I studied critical heritage studies in the Netherlands and then South Korea and through this I got to experience different cultural settings and their local ways of managing heritage on a larger scale, especially while doing field work in a local neighborhood in Seoul. And also by visiting crafts villages in Korea and Japan, I became more and more interested in cultural landscapes and the global discourse of sustainability. So after graduation, I moved to a fire-stricken mountain village in Portugal to volunteer at a permaculture farm. Um, here I learned that heritage and nature conservation areas are not always the answer to protecting our environment and so I wanted to learn how I could do something myself with cultural landscapes and be able to evaluate heritage theory and practice in such environments. So here I am now at Newcastle University researching landscape and heritage practices within the post-industrial landscape context. But I not only focus on the UK, this year I hope to include Southwest Sweden as well into my search for practices that enable future sustainable landscape. So this is going to be a second case study. As a project team, we met for the first time in the Netherlands. Uh, we were taught research ethics, among other things, but especially appealing for me was the hands-on experience with talking to different stakeholders during an urban planning project simulation we had. Uh, sadly, this was the last time we met in person as a group, because uh, since the outbreak of the coronavirus, we have been quite cooped up and research methods have changed drastically for me. Um, it was hard and it still is, but we learned to adapt and continued connecting through like work package meetings, public seminars and other Harryland events that continued online. So actually the first online masterclass for all 15 Harryland PhDs was hosted by Gothenburg University in May 2020 and it gave us a lot of theoretically interesting views on future landscapes and future heritage industrial heritage so since then the future of heritage and sustainability became more of a focus theme in my own project uh, so last year we learned a lot from each other in terms of creating online workshops and master classes um, so then it was our turn and the Newcastle University team and I was just blown away at what an amazingly creative and helpful team we have here and these workshops were on the spatial turn and focused heavily on the theory and practice of historic landscape management and identification and spatial research methods such as walking, talking and mapping. And this is also when I had the opportunity to moderate the key lecture that was on landscape identity. So part of it, we had a crash course in landscape characterization and geographic um, information system software. And that was really empowering for me actually to see how my spatial but qualitative uh, perspective on landscape could be translated to an actual map with data. I think I learned a lot in terms of practical research skills, but it also further inspired me to include the holistic ideas about sustainable landscapes that have been woven throughout all the workshops so far. I now try to include a perspective on how environmental, cultural, economic and social sustainability interact on the scale of a cultural landscape and how 
sustainability goals are present and interpreted in heritage practices on the ground and how they affect the, the changes in the landscape, mainly within the post-industrial context. So I look at ecological risks, social cultural changes, social economic issues and focus on economic regeneration, how this all kind of interacts. Um, it was a challenge at first as a PhD student using mainly methods from the field of anthropology and critical heritage studies. There are lots of lockdowns here in the UK, but luckily everyone has slowly adjusted over time. And now I have involved myself with local heritage organizations online to do interviews and talks about their sustainability strategies and heritage practice. So when the UK government allows it again, I get to go out in the field and experience the landscape that I've already been told about. And hopefully I soon get to continue the second part of my fieldwork in Sweden and see some of my colleagues in real life again. So yeah, I think me and the people of the project are learning what it means to go through a lot of uncertainty. Um, but through this project, we are actually learning how to analyze this change and understand it and how we can create sustainable landscapes. So the issues we face now do not have to have such a big impact in the future. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening and I hope everyone enjoys the symposium. Thanks, Anna. And thanks, Gert-Jan, for introducing the vision, mission, and also the setup of, of Harriland. Anna, I was really impressed by your short documentary, talking about art. I think uh, it's very creative and also very powerful. I love that you shared your journey to Harriland with us. And that brings me to my first question for Gert-Jan. Mm. What was your journey? to Harryland. So what experiences actually led you to come up with this idea for Harryland? Yeah, thank you, Nils. Uh, good question. Um, all of us, I mean, Harryland is, of course, a collective endeavor, and all of us have brought their experiences, um, one diverse than the other. Um, my, my own um, past, actually, maybe it's good to start Briefly, when uh, I started as an archaeologist, as a student, uh, working on landscapes. That was my first experience with landscapes. Uh, working mostly in Italy on classical landscapes. I did classical archaeology and focusing on the influence, the impact of Greeks, Romans, uh, colonization, conquest and urbanization on landscapes. Then, gradually, that widened, actually, that perspective, doing a PhD. Uh, I was influenced very strongly by the French historian Fernand Brodel, world famous by now, and um, well, he called attention for the long durée, the long term of landscapes, from the very distant past to the present, as a matter of fact. And I started to investigate, indeed, uh, landscapes from the very distant past to the present. Uh, and then I realized at a certain moment that that, that landscapes don't finish uh, with in the present and that we are not the end of a process, uh, observers only. Uh, no, we are part of that process. Uh, that's continuous process of landscape changing, of landscape designing. And um, I thought it was time to take up the responsibility and to participate in designing landscape with my historical and archaeological heritage. Because indeed, I do think that historians and archaeologists have a lot to tell. You could argue, as um, the Mentimeter has pointed out, what, what use could be made, and we can discuss that later on, but I do think that they have a lot to tell. And uh, we've, I've brought that in practice in Italy, for instance, in, um, in, in an area where we've been working on a landscape reserve together with local uh, communities, with uh, local municipalities, and well, trying to engage um, citizens in general. And, and at the same time, I've been developing this ID, methods, tools, concepts with international colleagues at a, let's say, uh, international level, and that is where Heritage Ireland emerged, actually. Um, on the one hand, the transnational perspective, on the other hand, 
I still cherish very much the local level of the living labs, as we call them, uh, where we bring into practice actually our ideas and methods. Thanks. Could, could you uh, just explain how you involve locals in your activities? So how, how do they appear on the scene and, and what do they contribute to the work you do in the landscape? Yes, definitely. I mean, it's at various levels, actually. Um, we engage them. Uh, first of all, we consider ourselves, uh, and we, with we, I mean, especially the, the local group of, let's say, collaborators uh, with which I, well, let's say, my, um, my companions in crime. And, and uh, we, what we do, we consider ourselves part of that local community. So um, we, uh, together with the other local groups, uh, we establish, for instance, meetings in which discuss uh, and debate about future plans. We do so also with well, digital tools, for instance, that we are experimenting with in university. And uh, we actually invite people to uh, bring into practice actually also their ideas of planning or of designing the local landscape. For instance, in local gardens, um, developing um, areas for local gardening. And, and, uh, but above all, we bring them in contact with the municipalities. We do think that um, a bottom-up approach can work only if it is uh, also at the same time uh, sustained by, uh, let's say, the top, let's say, by governmental institutions. Otherwise, they will have different, they will have no chances of survival. So, thanks. That's great. Um, Anna, I, I spoke of your journey to Harriland, but I'm also interested to hear why you chose Harriland. So, why did you decide to apply for a PhD position in an international network? like this, and then specifically Harriland. Um, yeah, so from my perspective, um, I studied critical heritage studies, um, partially in the Netherlands and partially in South Korea. So I was already uh, quite interested in having a more international job. <laughs> um, but it was also a bit of spur of the moment because um, I was actually living at a permaculture farm at the time I was applying and I was living in a partially burnt down forest. Um, and this was a landscape that was being heavily exploited while being actually on the buffer zone part of a Natura 2000 uh, project area. So I was actually just thinking how powerless I was in such an in such an area and I wanted to do something more, I saw hairy land, I saw landscape, I saw sustainability and I applied. <laughs> Thank you, that's great. Thank you. Um, now, I'd like to ask your opinion as well, uh, audience, on what the training of ESRs in heritage planning should actually focus on. So we go back to menti.com and if you enter the code, you will see this question. What should the training of heritage planning ESRs focus on? And I can't see the answers myself at the moment, so if someone can bring that up to the screen, that's wonderful. Yes, yeah, so Harriland trains students to become experts in managing heritage landscapes. What should they focus on? And so far, it's actually facilitating debate and information exchange about the landscape, above conservation and protection, and above planning. But I see that the views are shifting a bit. Yes, so it's, it looks like that moderation is actually the key skill that a, ne a network like Herland should focus on, and that conservation and planning are kind of equally important, but at a second rank. Um, Anna, how do you feel about this? Do you agree with the poll? Uh, yeah, I think as a researcher, we are more and more inclined to become a moderator in the kind of projects we are involved in. 
Um, personally, I think it's really, really good to being able to connect people. Um, so this is part of the moderatorship, but it's also about creative leadership in, in bringing a vision to fruition. Um, like for after Harry Land, if we go into these jobs. Um, but I'm also learning that like uh, firsthand from my secondment right now, because there's someone who's taking on a giant project within the landscape of, of post productivity, and he's trying to implement all sorts of sustainability goals. Um, and he needs to bring in a lot of different expertise, a lot of different people from different sectors. So I think this connectivity and being able to produce that creative leadership is very important. Thanks very much, Anna. Our next question is also by Menti. And the question is, what project would you prefer in your own neighborhood? Is it a community garden project, a museum project or heritage park, or a circular economy shop? And you can tell us what you prefer in your own backyard. So what changes do you welcome? I see that many people have put in their input, but I cannot unfortunately see the output. It's not visualized on the screen. Let's see if we can do something about that. Okay. I'm afraid I'll have to come back to this question then later. Yes, it's there. Oh, it's wonderful. So. Actually, the majority, more than 50%, would welcome a community garden project. And the rest of the people are basically divided between a circular economy shop and a museum project or heritage park. Anna, how do you look at these results? Do you agree um, with the popular view or...? <laughs> Maybe it's it's culturally divided. I don't know about who our viewers are, but uh, I think a garden project is very tangible, and everyone can participate in that, and everyone can reap the benefits of that. So I think that's more tangible for for a lot of people. Okay. Um, yes, and Gertjan, you seem to indicate um, that all landscapes and all aspects of the landscape have heritage potential. So even this circular economy shop or community garden project can be considered heritage, is that correct? It is correct, yes, indeed. Um, maybe let me, explain, let, let me explain what I mean with broadening the definition of heritage. Please. As a matter of fact, uh, you might argue, indeed, in the end, uh, if everything is heritage, um, well, I mean, how do we do? Uh, do we have to preserve everything? Don't we risk fossilization, total fossilization of society? As a matter of fact, that is a remark that is often heard. Uh, and um, however, I don't think so. As a matter of fact, um, what we cherish most and what is, I think, important is that uh, we do not, with this uh, approach, we do not mean that we wish to defend uh, heritage at all costs against change. As a matter of fact, change is vital to what we, what we do. As a matter of fact, um, change, uh, we continuously study, investigate change in the definition of heritage, and this is a perfect example. Uh, indeed, one uh, well, you call the circular economy her heritage, but uh, a more concrete example is, for instance, the plastic soup in the globe's oceans. As a matter of fact, there are people nowadays that would uh, argue that this is heritage. Why? Because it's a relic of a specific way of thinking of a modernist lifestyle uh, in which, uh, of course, uh, well, uh, leading to, it, to environmental degradation. I'm not going into the details of it, but um, from that perspective, indeed, it can be perceived uh, as heritage. 
and uh, therefore heritage definitions change continuously. It's not that we think that everything is a heritage, uh, but everything has potential heritage value. And, and, and so that is why I think that we should uh, allow, indeed, the mixture of uh, circular economy shop, uh, a community garden project, and a museum project. Uh, heritage is not only related to museums, uh, to the past. And um, as a matter of fact, I do think it is perfectly possible to have a polyfunctional uh, area. That's what we're creating, for instance, in southern Italy, a large um, landscape reserve with all three functions uh, engaged in them. And we are indeed presenting it as the heritage of the future, the heritage landscape of the future. Thank you. That's great. Thank you to both of you, Anna and Gert Jan, for this very nice kickoff to the Herland session. But now that I have you here on the stage, Gert Jan, um, a quick question about the rest of the Herland session. And you uh, decided on two sub sessions. Can you explain what the main themes are and? why they highlight how Herland can contribute to the planning of future landscapes. Right, so yes, Herland has 15 PhD researchers, 15, more or less 15 senior researchers. That is an enormous variety of themes. We couldn't show them all, clearly. And we've chosen two of them. Uh, for, the, well, the major region is to show where possible potential conflicts are, as a matter of fact. And uh, the first one is indeed on, uh, by, by Linda Egbert and Marilena Mela, and uh, it is on adapting historical landscapes to the energy transition. I think everybody feels the potential conflict in this. Imagine our poster here. This is what uh, adapting historical landscape to the energy transition might end up with, as a matter of fact. And um, so that is one. Um, we, want, we, well, well, we wish to bring uh, to the fore these potential conflicts. The other one is by Pirus Nurian and Nan Bai, which is, uh, well, the title will be shown uh, shortly, but uh, which is rather uh, the challenging us that are generally focus, focused on specific physical regional, local landscapes and landscape change, they take a different perspective. They take a global, digital perspective and argue that indeed we should not limit ourselves only to the local perspective, that, but that from a local perspective, the community, the global community is, becomes something completely different, a different concept. And I found it very challenging, and that's why we invited them to do these presentations. Thank you very much. And we will see you uh, at the end of the Herland session again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that brings us to the first uh, sub-session, which focuses on heritage and the energy transition. So how can we adapt highly valued cultural landscapes to the energy transition? Do heritage and energy transition naturally clash, or can they reinforce each other? And we will first hear from Marilena Mela about her PhD research in the Herland project. Marilena is stationed at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, and we will now hear her talk. Hello, uh, this is Marilena, and in my research I look at island landscapes and on the relationships of spatial planning with place identity. Uh, in this presentation, I will talk specifically about renewable energy projects and their interactions with heritage. Uh, so, island populations have a long history of adapting and changing conditions. Uh, they had to make use of limited resources and survive in harsh climates. And so, we could say that island landscapes have a long heritage of autarky, resilience and sustainability. Today, European islands uh, often face uh, challenges of peripheriality. The energy transition is uh, bringing changes to island landscapes and is being expressed in urgent and material ways that take different forms in different places, depending on geopolitics, uh, national policies or local stories. 
I argue here that it is only through empirical landscape research that we can capture the diversity of the energy discussion. Uh, for that, I will tell three stories, hoping that uh, stimulating discussions can emerge through their difference. My first story is about uh, the island of Ameland in the Dutch Wadden Sea region. Uh, Ameland uh, 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 is part of uh, the Wadden Sea where the open flat landscape is nationally protected. In 2007, the Wadden Islands decided to pursue energy sufficiency. However, any renewable uh, infrastructure had to align with the strict protection regulations. The idea for a solar park came from the municipality and the Islanders Energy Cooperative uh, and the solar park was constructed in 2016 and at the time it was the biggest one in the Netherlands. Uh, opponents of the project uh, stressed at the time of its construction the impact, the visual impact on the landscape as well as the loss of valuable agricultural land. Nevertheless, today it looks like the solar park is becoming interweaved with the identity and projected image of the island. We will next travel to the Cyclades and tell the story of the islanders' resistance against wind turbine developments. Many big-scale projects have been granted permission, making use of a spatial planning framework that prioritizes renewables as economic development at the expense of local specificities. Uh, the turbines and accompanying works would have a very big effect on the small-scale landscape, as it's also being stressed by a recent Europa Nostra nomination. Uh, other arguments against uh, this development include uh, uh, harms in biodiversity and on the vulnerable water ecosystem of the islands. In the island of Tinos, residents and local authorities collectively oppose uh, the construction of turbines and demand the development of a proper spatial planning framework. Through conflict, islanders interact with a top-down spatial planning process that did not include them originally. And uh, the landscape emerges then as something valuable that should be handled with care. My last story is about the Orkney archipelago in Scotland, uh, where many big commercial projects coexist with community renewables, generating revenue for these remote places. Uh, Orkney uh, has a long history in renewables, as it was also home to the first tested wind turbines in the UK. But it is also home to uh, the emergent marine renewables industry. Uh, big companies test their innovative devices in the waters of Orkney archipelago. And uh, ethnographer Laura Vatz tells the very compelling tale of the multiple relationships of the islanders with energy, including the design of a smart grid, electric cars, uh, and a hydrogen-fueled ferry. Uh, so, in seeing uh, the three stories together, it is clear that sustainability can take many forms. It is only complete when it integrates ecological, social and cultural processes with the individual heritages of its place. As the history of islands show, landscape change is truly sustainable when it comes not from the outside, but from the inside and is generated by the islanders. In the three stories, we saw different instances of people caring for the future of their landscapes. This reminds that the future is not unique and is not centrally produced. Small and peripheral places make different futures through everyday stories of innovation, creativity and resistance. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Marilena. That's very intriguing to see your work in three different corners of, uh, of Europe. Um, and I'd like to involve the audience by posing a question to them, because your presentation was about landscape change. And my question is, 
to the audience who should be responsible for managing landscape change. I'd like to hear your thoughts. So, do you feel it should be the local authorities and cooperatives, national governments, or transnational organizations? So far, it seems to be that national and local are in a tie together. But we also have the transnational organizations represented here. I can see. It's wonderful to see. Um, I'd like to hear your views on this, um, Marilena. Does this, uh, does this result surprise you that local is being preferred? Well, no. From my point of view, I think we really should prioritize local knowledge in, in many ways, uh, in academia as much as in policy. So I'm happy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's also in line with your, your very clear statement that sustainable landscape change means change that comes from the inside. And related to this, I have a question uh, from a member of the audience, and it's as follows. As an islander from Greece, and also a member of the Greek Eco Greens party, I have to ask you how we can confront between local societies resisting against mega wind parks. So how should they deal with this reality, in your view? Well, yeah, it depends uh, who this question uh, refers to. So from our point of view, as uh, let's say people working with heritage and landscapes, uh, or at least from the point of view of my research, I think it is our like duty to uh, truly listen to, to local societies and uh, truly listen to the arguments they make and uh, uh, then maybe try to relate them to spatial planning or policy making. Uh, and I think uh, the example of Greece really shows um, how spatial planning and development can really be unsustainable in the long term. Uh, so I would say that it is our role to deal with it as, as heritage professionals. Okay, because in the previous discussion with Anna and Gertjan, we discovered that moderating such tense uh, situations uh, are, are key skills. So uh, how would you like to contribute to a tense discussion like that in the future? I think uh, what also my research, my presentation tried to show is that uh, uh, a very important line of inquiry lies in uh, really going to very local stories and trying to hear and include as many voices as possible and then tell their stories. So I, I would really like this to be my contribution. Thank you very much, Marilena, for your wonderful presentation and, and also for your interaction with the questions. It was a pleasure. Uh, we will now speak to your supervisor, Linda Egbert, who's joining us here live in the studio. She's an assistant professor in heritage studies at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. And my first question is, Marilena's uh, research focuses on islands. Uh, how different is the situation on the, on the mainland? So are wind turbines, solar panels much more easily integrated in historic landscapes there? Well, thank you, Niels. Um, it is not that easy, of course. But there are some general impressions that I can share with you about uh, islands or islandscapes, as we like to call them. In Western culture, we have uh, um, quite a stereotypical idea of islands as hideaways from modernity, as places that are rural, that are peripheral, um, and that should stay that way in a, in a certain sense. So islands tend to be uh, rather well protected in terms of natural and cultural heritage values and well uh, institutionalized in that way which might make it difficult for landscapes transformations like climate mitigation and adaptation measures to occur. On the other hand, if you look at islands historically, they might have been the better um, connected places in the world. They might have been the generators and starting points of globalization. So in that sense, uh, maybe islands after all are not that peripheral. And Marilena's research demonstrates very clearly that 
uh, the, the energy transition can also be a, a means for islands to express their autonomy, their islandness uh, in a new way by, uh, by showing how they can be the front runners in the uh, energy transition. You see that in Orkney Islands, you see that in Ameland, but you also see that, for example, in Samso in Denmark, uh, that is really an icon of uh, renewable energies. Thank you very much. Um, my next question kind of broadens the topic of discussion somewhat from the, let's say, transformation of historical landscapes as a result of uh, the energy transition to the contribution of viewing these landscapes as cultural values in the process of landscape change. So I was wondering how awareness of this can, can actually help when it comes to climate mitigation measures. I sense that your question is a sort of a reconciliation of trying to, to move beyond the preservation response, right? To move beyond, okay, we value the past, so we need to stop change. Absolutely. How can we use heritage and cultural values to actually move forward? Well, if you look at the past as a sort of a repository of past resiliencies of how communities have dealt with change in the past uh, and use them as a sort of source of inspiration, um, then we completely transform our ideas about how the past relates to the future and it opens up many new possibilities to connect these diff sort of different realms. Thank you very much. I'd like to involve uh, the audience now um, and then get your response as well, uh, Linda. So the question to the audience is, what should we prioritize to reach sustainability of future landscapes? So please go to menti.com and you can choose between natural environments, the well-being of humans and non-humans, and changes in the economy. It seems to be a tight race. Yes, but so far it's natural environments in the lead and the well-being of humans and non-humans and changes in the economy at a tie. Uh, Linda, what, what's your view on this? What, what should we prioritize to reach sustainability of future landscapes? Do you agree that the natural environments are the most important? Um, well, it's changing again It's now. changing rapidly. Uh, and that, that makes me rather happy. I think... Uh, uh, it represents the dynamics in the audience that we have today that these opinions differ and that's I think a good thing because that that really facilitates dialogue. Um, the well-being of humans and non-humans is much more inclusive and relational than saying okay the natural environments are, are the most important. Eventually care for nature is important for well-being of humans as well as a to maintain our existence as a species on earth I think uh, natural uh, heritage and the care for it is is absolutely essential. So these don't think these things don't exclude each other. I think they're they can be mutual mutually reinforcing, but it takes uh, it takes a lot of effort to overcome this human non-human dichotomy. And I think that's one of the main assignments for well maybe the the next generation of heritage managers uh, yes. and. Uh, um, so the, the, the ESRs that Terra Nova and Heriland both uh, tend to train. Thank you very much for those insights and thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, and thank you, of course, to Marilena as well, who was joining us remotely from, from Greece. Um, this brings us to the next session, um, which is rather different. So in the just a previous session, we focused on the local, regional and national communities and authorities involved in the planning process. And this session that's coming now takes a very different perspective, a global one. Thanks to new information technologies and far greater mobility, we are now connected with people and landscapes across the globe. Our actions influence people and landscapes that are geographically far removed. We have become part of so-called small worlds. In a moment, Heriland ESR Nanbai will tell us how he applies this small worlds perspective in his heritage planning research. 
But first we will hear from his supervisor, Pirus Nurian, who is an assistant professor of design informatics at the TU Delft. Pirus will tell us about the small world's development and how we can model these global interactions. Good day to you. In this presentation, I'm going to tell you about my fascination with small platonic globes and the exciting simulations that we can run on their digital models. Can an architect reimagine the whole planet Earth? This is what Richard Buckminster Fuller tried to do by introducing the Dymaxion globe as a tool for political geographers, coining the word Dymaxion as a combination of the words dynamic maximum and tension. His goal was to create a representation of the planet Earth that would easily convert to a flat map with minimal distortions while still being a round globe. We asked ourselves if we could make a digital version of such a globe and animate the hypothetical fates of our planet on it. These are the only five polyhedrons that are perfectly regular for tiling a spherical surface into exactly equal polygonal facets, providing the most regular tessellations of a spherical globe. Well, the best platonic solid with the largest number of facets has only 20 triangles, but we could not possibly simulate the fate of the planet at the resolution of only 20 triangles and their dynamics. So we decided to subdivide it further into more triangles. Here is a simple picture showing how all distances on these globes are computed as geodesics or walks around the globe on triangular tiles. Such paths form the basis of most geographical concepts, especially because they show physical distances on the planet Earth for traveling by airplanes, cars, trains, ships, or even horses. If something is far away from you, then you are less likely to visit it or interact with it in any way. This could be the curse of geography, which is better known as the first law of geography, formulated by the famous American geographer Waldo Tobler. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. We are so accustomed to the idea of measuring distance with meter sticks or yard sticks that we might forget about the most universal measure of distance, time. If you can get somewhere faster than somewhere else, practically you are closer to that space. The same effect that railways have had in shrinking the size of Europe in time, a hypothetical hyperloop network can have on the whole planet Earth. So far, I have been referring to the idea of small world networks implicitly, but now I am referring to the main concept literally, a small world in which you can get to know anybody just by making a few new friends. If we switch our notion of distance to the number of friends we have to make on a social network to get in touch with someone, then our world will get even smaller and more explicitly similar to the so-called small world networks on social media. My colleague Nan Bai will explain this further in his presentation. The late British mathematician John Conway invented this relatively simple game of life in the year 1970, which has had profound effects on the complexity theories of cities and landscapes, for example in making land use transport interaction models. The Schelling segregation model is arguably the most important example of cellular automata models used for learning policy lessons on how Relatively small and seemingly unimportant decisions and actions by individuals often lead to significant unintended consequences for a large group. In this famous example, Thomas Schilling shows that a slight and non-malicious preference to have neighbors of the same race eventually leads to a completely segregated city. This is a key example showing how complex network models can be used in simulations not only for making predictions, but also for understanding the mechanisms and forces that bring about change. In collaboration with the Y Factory Design Research Group at the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment of TU Delft, we designed the course Planet Maker in two rounds between the years 2017 and 2019. The first time for simulating what-if scenarios and envisioning future globes, and the second round for making digital simulation games. In the remainder of this talk, I will present some totally fictitious simulation models that we made for two reasons. Number one, raising awareness on the complexity of the fate of the dear old planet Earth. And number two, teaching the students some essential methods and techniques from generative sciences for simulating complex geospatial systems. The gist of the course Future Models in the Planet Maker Studios was to combine complex space networks modeled on polyhedral globes 
and complex process networks in physical board games and digital simulation games. In this short presentation, I cannot possibly bore you with the gory details of how we actually made the simulation models, but I can at least give you some hints and an example. We use cellular automata, agent-based models, gravity models, and Markov chains in particular to simulate diverse phenomena related to climate change, agriculture, migrations, trade flows, and their effect on the planetary landscape. In other words, the common denominator of all models was the changes made on the landscape technically called the finite colored land use labels of the triangular cells of the polyhedral globes. Here is an exemplary cellular automata model from Planet Maker 1 simulating the economical dynamics brought about by local trades as a finite state machine whose cells are small triangles on an unrolled icosahedral map. Here you can see a screenshot of a simulation game prototype on renewable energy production and its effects on land use from the Planet Maker 1 studio. Here you can see multiple screenshots of the simulation game prototypes made by our students in the course Planet Maker 2. These models simulated the emergent dynamics of landscapes as complex consequences of the interplay of policies on trade, migration, energy production, agriculture and ecosystems with geographical distances, barriers and feedback loops. Our global landscapes are constantly changing. We can use simulation game models not only to educate future practitioners, but also to improve our holistic understanding from the complexity of the processes underlying spatial, environmental, economic or demographic dynamics. Understanding the mechanisms and forces resulting in change is necessary for formulating new policies. If we manage to understand and replicate such complex mechanisms or at least identify their fundamental principles, we can use this understanding to nudge public behavior towards more sustainable futures. At the end of the day, small ideas shared by many people may be more powerful than plans dictated by a few. Herewith, I would like to thank all of these students and my colleagues at the Y Factory and Design Informatics Research Groups for an enjoyable collaboration. Here I am leaving some references for those who might be interested to read more on how complexity theories can be utilized in making the next generation simulation models for understanding the dynamics of future landscapes. I am Piers Nurian, an assistant professor of design informatics at the Delft University of Technology. Have a great day on Earth. Thank you very much, Pirus. And thank you for, for showing us that it is indeed possible to model, simulate, analyze these global networks, the interaction between people and the impact they have on the landscape. And it's exciting to have the opportunity to work with you in the context of, of Harryland. It kind of shows the power of the interdisciplinary approach. Um, we will now hear from Nan Bai, who's an early stage researcher in Harryland. He has a background in computer science in, and in psychology, and he applies that in his PhD at the Technical University in Delft, which is focused on social inclusion perceived about heritage values through social media. Nan, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Nan Bai, a PhD researcher at TU Delft and an ASR in Harryland project as well. It is an honor for me to be here to be able to share with you some of my research motivation, also as an empirical extension and application of the lecture given by Pirutz on Small World. Here I will show you that the world is also rather small in cultural heritage and landscape planning. The work package in Harryland that I'm in is called Democratization. The main topic of my research is to understand the social inclusion happening on social media platforms while the online community expresses their opinions, emotions and experience on cultural heritage properties. To conduct this research, an important question to answer is, who is this community representing? A quick answer is, the concerned citizens. Furthermore, this concept of citizen is a dynamic one, which is not necessarily constrained by geographical proximity.
Perhaps you still remember the tragic fire in Notre Dame, Paris, in April 2019. This drastic tragedy caused people from all over the world caring, concerning, and expressing their sorrow on all sorts of social media platforms. Not only showing emotions, many community members are also giving constructive concerns about whether there should be a restoration or a redesign. One year after the tragedy, when things went back to normal, people started to share their everyday experience and stories about this cultural heritage again. Because of the travel constraints caused by the coronavirus, this group of concerned citizens seemed to shrink to mainly the locals. While we look at the total percentage of search worldwide recorded by Google Trends, we will see that four of the major heritage properties in Europe share the interest of online community evenly from 2015 to 2020. However, if we add Notre Dame to the search, the extreme focus on it when the fire happened diminished all the other interests on a relative scale. We can borrow this concept from neuroscience and biology. And call the two situations baseline and activated. While some radical events happened, the concern of a broader group of citizens are triggered and activated, and this make the globe fully connected, like a small world with such common concerns. A further proof of such a small world can also be seen on Google Trend when we look at the dominant search and keywords among the five cultural heritage properties here. We can see that one year before and one year after the fire, the search interests globally are more diverse, and that during the outburst of the fire, almost the whole globe focused on Notre Dame. As you have already seen in the lecture by Pirates, the concept of small world is rather common in everyday life. We can argue that the concerned citizens form a smaller world during activation, which goes across the national and geographical boundaries and bring the whole world together to concern with cultural heritage planning. To make use of this significant power of connected small world of concerned citizens. A new initiative about our world heritage started last year and is rather active this year. It seeks to protect the heritage through the lens of civil society. As a side note, despite this new initiative, similar ideas have already been raised in the 2011 recommendation on the historic urban landscape by UNESCO, which is an important guideline for many researchers and practitioners, including our UNESCO Chair of Heritage and Values and our Heritage Project. As a conclusion, cultural heritage and landscape are not isolated spots owned only by the local government. Everyone concerned can form a global citizen network thanks to the small world. We believe those who care can and should make a difference in cultural heritage planning in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Nan, for your splendid talk, and thank you for joining us now live.、Uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions.、Um, First of all, I was intrigued by this idea that you want to differentiate between ordinary and extraordinary situations.、Um, what would be different in either case, and why is it so important for your research? Thank you, Niels, for your question. And as you have already seen in the presentation, that people kind of act differently in the both situation. While there's something happens. When it comes to the extraordinary situation, then the whole globe is activated, and they come to express their ideas and emotions, and also their thoughts. So this is a a moment when the world gets smaller. But、um, not only these radical events, radical moments、uh, are important.、Uh, we are living also in an everyday life. So it's also important to know what are people thinking about in the ordinary、uh, or uh, everyday uh, time. So those two、um, are different, but are、uh, equally important for our research. Thank you. That's that's very clear. My second question is:、um, What do you hope and and believe your digital approach to community? 
can contribute to the future planning, so the planning in historic urban, urban landscapes. So what contribution do you foresee? Um, I would say that um, our research is kind of um, um, give us a chance to hear the voice of more people. So uh, traditionally, when we have the interview with the people or we have the questionnaires, we can only engage, let's say, hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, but with the help of digital technology like social media, we can know what are people thinking in the scale of millions or billions of people, how they express their idea, how they are uh, showing their intrinsic values uh, on those cultural heritage or the landscape planning. So we have the chance to know more. So this will give us more input as landscape planners in the future. So we don't do things too arbitrarily, but we have the ideas from the whole uh, concerned community. Thank you very much. And for my last question, I'd like to return to Ghet Jan's introductory talk. And he, he spoke of the living labs and two living labs where we as entire consortium, as entire network, uh, will do an assignment. Uh, one in Rome, in Ostiense, and also one in Jerusalem. And I was wondering what your digital methods uh, could there do and how they can go, in, go hand in hand with traditional face-to-face -face methods. Are you ready for that challenge? <laughs> yeah, that's a nice question. Um, I think that uh, this method is really a supplementary uh, method. Uh, it is not meant to replace any of the traditional method because we kind of know different aspects from uh, the research. So um, through the digital one with social media, we can kind of um, have a broader view or have a, um, a more, um, how to say, uh, concerning more people. Uh, but with a traditional face-to-face uh, uh, -face interview, we can know deeper. So. Um, when we combine the two, we have both the knowledge of a wide and a deep knowledge, which can be really nice for our, our uh, research. Thank you, Nan, for sharing these exciting ideas with us and good luck with your, your research. I look forward to Thank seeing you. you in real life again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'd like to welcome Kiki back to the stage because I'm curious to hear <laughs> how you're getting on with, with your song. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm still a bit in a doubt, I must say. <laughs> yeah, and also, all these great ideas, they really um, uh, pop new ideas in my mind. So, yes. well, it's, it's you, I mean, I could still, I'm still in between for the revolution stuff and the small stuff. You know, I, I could say, maybe we should change a little bit <laughs> if we, like, step by step, yes. I, we could do that, but it, it's... Also, it feels more powerful after a day like this to go like, we should change, uh, everything's burning down. It's, maybe it's better. Yes. So I'm still in between. <laughs> so maybe you could guide me at home. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. So if, I mean, this already... Well, wonderful, it, it was quite rude. No, no, I mean, <laughs> this dilemma sounds wonderful because it can really go either way. So it's very exciting. This is a, a big cliffhanger. <laughs> but what you're really saying is that you, you guys at home can influence the outcome. Yeah, yeah. So, so please tell me how uh, I should uh, think about this because... Um, well, Nan will tell you to put away your guitar and do it in a digital way. <laughs> We can we can go at Clubhouse. <laughs> I think none would get me to Clubhouse <laughs> discussing this. <laughs> no, but um, um, well, that, that's that's uh, my, my uh, thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for giving <laughs> us an update, and I really look forward to uh, to hearing the the final result. And I really look forward to the next speakers. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome Gert Jan and Linde back to the stage for some closing remarks for the Harryland session. Um, and I first have a question for you, Gert-Jan, because in the scheme that you showed us, we saw many different disciplines collaborating, but we also saw the participation of industry and government. And 
I was wondering, should a historian or a heritage expert not just stay true to his or her discipline? Well, yes, I mean, that's a question which is actually quite often asked to me. Um, I've actually been compared with a politician when I start to talk about uh, Harryland, for instance, and, and, and being blamed for doing so, actually uh, should stick to uh, what I do, and uh, that is history, that is archaeology. And, um, well, I think um, I'm not, I don't agree with that. Um, I understand it. Um, history, archaeology have a tradition of, let's say, historical objectivity, respecting historical objectivity, um, doing it the Rankian way, according to the German uh, historical historian philosopher Ranke, wie um, es eigentlich gewesen ist. So uh, that is reconstructing the past as it has been, and far, keeping far from the present, keeping far from heritage, because heritage is something which is often considered to be spoiled by, indeed, the presence by politics, by economics, etc., etc. So we should keep far from that. Um, however, there are quite some changes have been going on the last decades. Um, the historian has changed. There is a common acknowledgement that indeed also the historian and the archaeologists are rooted, uh, have, have a social background. They are just human beings uh, with their families, with their social backgrounds with their political ideas, etc. So it's difficult to um, become unrooted. Uh, however, what stays, still stays is, is rigor, um, academic rigor. That's not to be torn, um, and, and that's still very strong. So uh, I do think that changes have been made, and, uh, and at the same time, heritage, the field of heritage has become an academic study. And so they have come very near to each other. I think, and uh, it's perfectly doable. Okay. Well. Thank you for those uh, thoughts. Linda, I have a very different question for you, uh, because you've been listening to, to uh, the whole session, and I was wondering what has surprised you or what has really caught your attention? Thinking about the last 45 minutes, one hour of Harriland discussions. I've seen very different focuses within each individual um, presentation and of course I've been involved since the beginning of the conceptualization of this project um, and it's wonderful to see how individual researchers have taken on the quite general descriptions that we as a team have given them and to make them specific personal local um, uh, and connected as well yes um, but at the same time uh, I, s I still s recognize the overarching principles of the question uh, whether or not to stay with the her heritage paradox and sometimes want to preserve what, what is good and what is stable. Yeah. And on the other hand, the desire to overcome, um, to overcome that, uh, that fixed position and yes. to, to accept change, to accept loss, uh, and to open up for the new possibilities that that might bring to society and the well-being of, of citizens. Because in the end, I feel uh, idealism with most candidates to wanting to contribute somehow to a better world by using heritage, and I find that very hopeful. Yes, thank you. My final question is for Gert Jan. If there's one thing, uh, this is in line with what Marike also asked, Stuart and, and Peter, if there's one thing that people take away from this session, What's the, the, the most important message you'd like to give them? I think, yes, um, to the policymakers, vision. I completely agree with what Peter said. Vision, you need a vision, and, uh, and of course, as a society, but uh, especially those who are in the lead, they need a vision. Uh, but um, if I would have to address society at large, I would say awareness. Awareness, uh, awareness of the fact that uh, there are there is not one heritage, there is not one landscape. There are multiple visions of uh, landscapes, of heritage, and, the, and, and we have to, in a way, um, in a way uh, collaborate together uh, in making it function. And so awareness of the need to recognize other people's visions and that may lead to discussion and debate. So awareness and debate. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all the speakers and also the people
people at home who participated in the Menti discussions and, and who posted questions to the speakers. Um, it was a great uh, session. Now we will have a lunch break. We will be back at 1.30 Central European time. Uh, and I, I really hope to see you all back. We have the keynote lecture uh, by UNESCO professor Mike Turner to look forward to about culture and sustainable development and the design of future landscapes. We have a debate to look forward to between members of Terra Nova and Heriland about their in input for future landscape design. And of course, we have the song uh, that Kiki will perform for us live. So I look forward to seeing you all back at 1.30.